The scripture this morning is from Nehemiah 8, verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and 8 to 10. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read it, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation, they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your so, strength. like many of you know, or for those of you who don't, last couple of weeks uh, we've been having a partnership with uh, an African American church here in town, uh, which means that last week I was pretty used to getting amens, and the week before that I know for a fact that you can give them. <clears throat> So, uh, if it shows up, that'll be just fine by me. So we have an interesting scripture for this morning. Well, it may not look interesting at the beginning of it. It sort of looks kind of odd, actually. Uh, what really happened right before our scripture is that the people had just finished building a wall. They built a wall, and then they gathered together in the town square, and they listened to the Torah, or the scriptures being read. At which point they started crying. They started weeping openly. Which seems a little bit strange to us. Because, well, they built a wall. And they read some scripture. Uh, whoop de do. <laughs> like, what's the big deal here? Why would they be moved to tears by this event? Well, to understand what the big deal is, we have to go back in time a little bit. We have to understand a little bit of the history of Israel. See, the people of Israel started off kind of small. They started with one guy, Abraham. Abraham was basically a nomad and followed God wherever Yahweh, God, would take him. Although there was this one point where God showed Abraham the entire land of Canaan, which would become the land of Israel, and made this promise. That, he would, that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars and, and his descendants would eventually inhabit the land of Israel. That promise is key. Remember that. That promise was key for the people in our scripture, but it, was also, it also continues to be key for the Jewish people today. After Abraham, we find this unfolding saga of events that runs over the course of the whole Old Testament. Um, we're talking a thousand years or, or better. Over that time, we find Abraham's grandsons turning into the 12 tribes of Israel. We, we, we find the people being taken into slavery in Egypt. And then we find Moses leading them out and wandering in the desert for 40 years and then eventually uh, going into conquering and living in the land of Canaan, which became the land of Israel. This story or the saga involves a long tumultuous period where they were led only by the priests of the temple and it was up and down. Finally, it led the people to demand to become a nation 
like all of the other nations around them. And so they demanded a king, which God was not exactly pleased about, but gave them a king anyways. And so we get the first king of Israel, Saul. After Saul, we have David and then Solomon. And during their time, they basically established Israel as a nation. They fought wars, they took over territory, they conquered more people and and area. Solomon even built the temple in Jerusalem, built a permanent place to worship God. Now after, after Solomon, unfortunately, things kind of fall apart a little bit. There's a civil war where there's ten tribes in the north that split off from the two big ones in the south. Now what's interesting to note here is that the, the ten tribes in the north eventually get destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. But even though that had happened, even though there was this civil war, this division, you have these two tribes in the north, and they believed that they would never be defeated. They believed that it wasn't possible for them to be defeated, primarily because they had the temple of God in their city, in the city of Jerusalem. Because of the promises that God made to Abraham, because they have the temple that was built by Solomon, because they believe they have the literal presence of Yahweh sitting in this temple, they believe it is not possible for them ever to be destroyed. The idea that Jerusalem could be defeated was unthinkable. It was the center of their culture, their faith, their worship, their government, their entire identity. They could not possibly imagine Jerusalem being defeated. But then in the year 587 BCE, that's exactly what happened exactly what happened. There were several different superpowers floating around that day, or floating around the region in that day, and eventually the people of Israel got into it with the Babylonian Empire. And after a few skirmishes, the Babylonians decided to be done with these Jewish people, and so they destroyed the city. They flattened the temple, and they took the people captive in Babylon. Now, it's hard to underestimate how big of a deal this was for the Jewish people. When they were taken into exile, their entire identity, their entire place of worship was destroyed. It was the loss of their culture, their faith, their their status as a nation. All of it was gone in the blink of an eye. The truly unthinkable had happened. For 50 years, They were held in captivity in Babylon. About the year 538 BCE, when another superpower came in, uh, the Persian Empire, they came in and, well, defeated Babylon. They wound up destroying the Babylonian Empire, at which point the king of Persia said that all of the Jews could go back home to Jerusalem, and at one point even provided some funds to make that happen. Now that's the story up until our books for today. Ezra and Nehemiah are two books that pick up the story at that point in time, when the Jews are preparing to come home from this exile. And in these two books, we get the story of the Jews making several trips back from Babylon to Jerusalem to start to rebuild. Eventually, about 520 BCE, the temple gets rebuilt and the people start moving back. Sixty years later, we get the priest Ezra showing up who goes back to Jerusalem not only to try and establish worship in the temple, but try and get people to follow the laws of Moses. Then in 445, there is this governor or this civil leader named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah undertakes the task of rebuilding the city wall of Jerusalem. Now the walls, uh, the city wall may seem like a mundane thing, but it's an important thing. If you're going to have a city, you need to have a wall. It is the thing that establishes it as an independent city. It was a key part in the process of moving back. The interesting thing is, he must have been a pretty good governor, because he got that wall built in 52 days, which is an impressive feat in and of itself. So in the story, first we have the temple being rebuilt, then we have the city walls being rebuilt, and then in our scripture. We have the Torah being read again, which is the people being rebuilt. Now to understand the impact of reading 
the Torah and the Scripture again in this kind of public setting at that point in time, we need to remember two things. The first of which is that the Torah is the thing that makes the Jewish people into a people. That is the thing that, that holds their entire faith identity. It's the thing that makes them different than everybody else. The Torah was key to being a Jewish person. The second thing that we need to remember is that at the point that the wall is rebuilt and that the Torah is read, it's been roughly 150 years since the beginning of the exile. And one of the interesting things in the scripture from Nehemiah or, or one of the surrounding scriptures from Nehemiah is that it makes mention that during the time of the exile, the Torah had been forgotten. People had lost the memory of what it meant to worship God and to be the people of God. Which means that in our scripture, it's been 150 years since people really understood what it meant to be the people of God. Our scripture marks the point where after 150 years, after the total and complete destruction of Israel, finally the temple has been rebuilt. Finally the walls of Jerusalem have been rebuilt. And finally, now the people of God are being rebuilt. This is a moment that has taken 150 years to happen, but it's a moment that the vast majority of people never thought would ever happen again. And so with all of that in mind, yeah, if I'd have been there on that day, I'd have been crying too. When they read the Torah again, they hear what it means to follow God. The moment that we see in our scripture is a key moment in the history of Israel. After the lowest point in their entire history, here we see that the story is not over. Here we see this holy city being reestablished. We see God being worshipped again, and we see the people of God being rededicated and reformed. This is a significant moment in the history of the people of Israel. And now that you know the story coming up to this moment, I want to turn our attention to one part of this story. Which has to do with this whole business about building a wall. In particular, this, this idea of building a wall and its connection to the people of God. See, walls, well, walls are interesting things. And this wall in Jerusalem was no exception. On one hand, walls can be used to keep people out. They can be used as a defense against other people. And part of the purpose of this wall around Jerusalem was most certainly to keep some people out, people who wanted to attack Jerusalem. But interestingly, that's not the only purpose of a wall. A wall can also be used to create space. It can be used to create a safe space for people to gather. To gather. And in particular, in this wall, it's used to create a space for people to gather together, but also to worship God and to become a new community, to become a new people. There are very different uses for walls, and the difference between how they are used really depends on the gate. It depends on the gates of the wall. City gates were an important part of the wall, not uh, just in practicality, but in community life. On a basic level, whether or not your gate is closed determines whether or not your wall becomes a fortress or whether it becomes a place of welcome. More than that, though, gates in ancient times were places where the community gathered. They were places where uh, elders of the city would decide court cases. They, they were the place where arguments and treaties were made. I don't think it's an insignificant thing that when the Torah is read after the wall is finished, it's not read in the temple. It's read in the city square by the gate of the wall. The dedication of this wall around Jerusalem and the dedication of the people themselves taps into something very interesting that runs throughout the whole Bible. On one hand, there's the dedication of the people takes us back to the idea that the people of God are a chosen people because they're supposed to be a priestly people. 
Which means that just as a priest helps others connect to God, a priestly nation is supposed to help the entire world connect with God. What's more, however, the dedication of the wall points us to the idea that all of Jerusalem is supposed to be a holy place, not just the temple itself. Jerusalem is supposed to be a holy city, the purpose of which is to actually invite all people from around the world to come and connect with God. This is an idea that we see running throughout all of the scriptures. In Mark 11.7, we see Jesus quoting the prophet Isaiah from the Old Testament by saying that the house of God is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations and all people. At the end of the Bible, we get an even more intriguing image. We get the image of, of heaven coming down to earth. And that image in Revelation is one of a new city, a new Jerusalem that is thousands and thousands of miles across. And interestingly, in this image of heaven, well, it still has walls. There are still walls around the heavenly city. But most interestingly, it also says that that new heavenly city is supposed to be a place where all people from all nations and all tongues and all tribes gather together. And most intriguing, it specifically says that the gates of the walls will never be closed. They will always be open. See, in the Bible, walls are, are not exclusively meant to keep people out. In their best use, walls are meant to create a place for people to gather and to worship God and to create a new community. Walls are not just meant to shut out the world, but rather they are meant to be opened up and to create a gathering place for all people. In the Bible, walls are a necessary feature, but not for the purpose of pushing people away, but for the purpose of gathering them in. Which brings me to the main point for today. So far, I've given you an old overview of the Old Testament and a instruction on how to build an old, ancient wall. Who cares? <laughs> what does this have to do with today? Well, the answer, at least for me this morning, is that I think that this story has something to teach us about how we should view our own walls. And for once, I am not talking about metaphorical walls between people. I am talking about the literal stone walls of our church building. Or any church building, for that matter. See, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about recently is the future of the church. So the future of the church in general, but the future of this congregation. And one of the questions that I've been pondering uh, has to do with what sort of resources we have as a congregation. How are those resources uh, to be used, and in, and in what way can we put them into uh, good use? The question is, what has God already blessed us with? And what might that be telling us about what kind of ministry God is calling us to? And the thing is, when you look around this congregation, we have a tremendous amount of resources. We have all kinds of gifts and skills and talents that are really humbling and kind of amazing. At times it almost feels like an embarrassment of riches that God has blessed this congregation with. And among all of those different things, one resource in particular is this building. God has blessed us with a great big beautiful building to be able to gather together in. This is a tremendous resource that we have available to us. And quite frankly, well, it's a building that probably has more space than we even need. Which really raises the question, what should we do with this building? How are we to use this space that has been entrusted to us? And that question comes up from time to time in different settings. And as that question has come up, I've tried to pay attention to how our congregation has talked about this question. What are the attitudes that people have towards how we use our building? And as I've listened, I've heard two basic attitudes, and this is over, overly simplified, but, but in general, there, on one end, there is this idea that, that our building is something of a possession. It's ours to be protected, and it's, uh, if it comes right down to it, we need to protect this building from the community that surrounds it. On the other hand, there's a strong attitude that our building is really a gift from God that is meant to be shared with our community. It's meant to be opened up. Now what's interesting is that 
I think people are generally somewhere in the middle of those two attitudes, but from time to time, these two attitudes come up and they sort of clash with each other. And depending on where you're at, it leads us to make very different decisions about how we use our building. Now in some ways these two attitudes are very opposed to each other, but at the same time they also represent things that we need to hang on to, things that are important for our congregation. When you peel it back, the attitude that we need to protect our building from others is really rooted in a strong memory that what exists here today is the result of a lot of hard work from a lot of different people. What we see around us is not just brick and stone and mortar. It's the result of generations of people being faithful and committed to the work of God in this community. And at the same time, the attitude that we need to open our building up points us to the fact that this building, or any church building, is not meant to be closed off. We are not meant to build a monument to the past, but rather a place like this building is meant to create a space for people to come together to worship God and to become a new community. Just like the walls around Jerusalem, the whole point of a building like this is not to build a fortress to keep people out. The point of a building like this is to create a space for all people to come together, to grow, to learn, to fellowship, to support each other, and to worship God. And just like the people of Israel, it's also worth remembering that the whole point of being the people of God is not to isolate ourselves, but it's to go out into the world and invite people to come in and connect with God. As I read the scripture today from Nehemiah, and as I think about the future of our church and how we use our building, I hear the scripture speaking I hear the walls of Jerusalem crying out to us across the great expanse of history. I hear those walls calling to us, challenging us to make a choice. Are we going to let this building become a fortress against the outside world? Or are we going to allow these walls to truly be a house of prayer for all people, for all nations, no matter who they are? The walls of Jerusalem are crying out to us, asking whether or not this space will become a place of healing and hope and refuge for everyone. And just as the people of Israel were rededicated after the wall was built, we too must decide whether or not we are going to be a people through whom the healing and hope of God really does flow to the whole world.